Hey, everyone, come on in. We are so excited to have you here. Susan is off camera. She'll be right back. I'm Julie Bogart, and we welcome you to today's Q&A. We're thrilled that you're able to join us. And we had such a good time with you at the Homebound Conference, and we are following up a month and a half later just to check in, see how everyone's doing. So I'm Julie Bogart, and for those of you who are new, maybe your friends invited you or you don't know anything about me, I am from Brave Writer, and that is our company that teaches writing and language arts to all kinds of families, especially homeschoolers and new to homeschoolers. Here is Susan Wise Bauer from The Well-Trained Mind, and she is joining us as well. Susan and I have known each other for a couple of decades now. She homeschooled her four kids. I homeschooled my five, and we have grown-ups now in our lives. Susan is lucky. I will let her describe her quarantine experience. Mine has been a little lonely. I live alone in my big house. My kids are all over the globe, and so I have been giving myself nightly hugs. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to turn it over for a moment to Susan so she can welcome you and uh, tell you how she's been doing. Hey, Susan. Hey, Julie. And I, I wish I could give you a hug. <laughs> so here's a I virtual hug. hug. Um, I will say, uh, being quarantined with, I, we're we're very we are very blessed in that we're we are not only quarantined together. So right now it's me, my husband, um, and my two youngest, who are now 23 and 19. My 23-year-old has just graduated from college, and my 19-year-old is getting ready to hold, head off maybe in the fall. Um, so it's the four of us and then my parents. So we have a lot of people in the house, which, can I say, Julie, is both a good thing and sometimes <laughs> a challenge. <laughs> so um, I think whether you're quarantined um, alone or with people, there are challenges yeah. to be overcome. So actually, Julie and I thought we would just sort of start off by giving you an update as sort of where we are mentally, you know, at this point in the quarantine. I think we're all still just facing massive amounts of uncertainty and don't underestimate how incredibly draining and difficult that is to just not know what's going to happen next. And I think no matter what state you're in right now, you just don't know what's going to happen next. So that's difficult. Um, at the same time, from my point of view, I do feel like I'm I'm starting to, I'm, I'm a little less um, flat out taken aback and clueless than I was. I feel like I've started to get my feet under me a little bit. Um, I'm able to get back to writing. I would say during the first three or four weeks of the quarantine, I, I didn't write, I couldn't write. I would just sit and stare at my computer screen. And I'd say I'm operating right now at about 55% capacity. Mm -hmm. And um, I've kind of had to be okay with that. And I've also uh, taken on the, the project of, I always have a to-do list every day. I write down the things I want to accomplish. I have put on that to-do list things like um, cleaning the kitchen, fixing dinner, mm. watching a movie with the kids, all nice. of the things that are taking time um, in an acknowledgement that, you know, this too takes effort and is a worthwhile accomplishment. So I've really had to expand my, um, what did I do today? out to encompass things that before the quarantine, I wouldn't have put on a to-do list. I would have just taken as, you know, I would have just taken as, as routine. But, you know, things like I do, I do the grocery shopping now because my husband is immunocompromised. And so he's very uncomfortable leaving the house. Mm. Grocery shopping was always his job. So Tuesdays, I do the grocery shopping. And it's a big deal because first of all, we live out in the country. So it's a hike to get to the grocery store. Mm. Second, I can't usually find everything I need at the grocery store, so I have to then go to the drugstore and then maybe to the hardware store. And then third, there's just, it's stressful because I'm wearing a mask, I'm wearing gloves, I'm worried about people who aren't wearing masks and gloves, I'm worried about the cashiers, I'm concerned with, do I buy that package of ground beef even though I have one in the freezer in case I can't find any next week? So every expedition out to the grocery store turns into this multiple set of choices and challenges and by the time I get back I'm exhausted so now on my Tuesday you know my Tuesday task list you know I have write for three hours go to the grocery store and I cross off go to the grocery store because that was just as hard I so, totally I, I, no I totally get that in fact the closest experience I have had in my life that approximates what this feels like 
is the culture stress of adapting to living in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. We use the joke that when you move to a foreign country, you go to the post office and then come home and take a nap. Literally, the post office expedition mm -hmm. would take every ounce of energy, standing in a weird line, trying to express yourself in a foreign language, going through whatever their customs were for the package that you were picking up, uh, navigating public transportation yeah. in a foreign language, figuring out where women can stand, you know, I was in a Muslim country, like all those things. And I was wearing headscarves, sometimes masks. And so, and then I would get home and I couldn't figure out why I didn't feel like studying the language. All I wanted to do was just sleep. That's a little bit how quarantine feels. The things that we took for granted and had developed skills for to a level of automaticity are gone. And we're relearning how to do things that should be easy. And that ends up leaving you depleted for what you're supposed to do, homeschooling, writing book, whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I really, I relate to that. Uh, and I'm imagining, because we have heard from so many of you, that you are experiencing a duality of things. So on the one hand, those outings and these tasks feel like they demand more from me. On the other hand, I've really welcomed even the cancellation of things I was looking forward to. It's mm -hmm. sort of settled me down into um, a helpless state. I was so in charge of my life and schedule and choices. I saw a meme that said, maybe you can relate to this. It said, don't feel guilty if the pandemic is helping you set better boundaries in your life. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. thought, yeah, that's the other kind of happy side effect is suddenly I don't have to feel guilty for saying no. The pandemic said no for me. Yeah. And I just think I, I love your comparison to living in a foreign country and going to the grocery store is like going to an Italian post office. That makes total sense to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think one of my favorite memes that I've seen recently is Captain Kirk and he's standing in front of this whole row of red shirted crewmen. And he's saying, your task is to go to the grocery store and buy me a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. And I was like, yes, that is the amount of stress that I feel going to the grocery store. <laughs> That's actually great. I love that. And it, it does feel high stakes. I think that's one of the um, interesting moments that we're in coming back to have our Q&A now. So when we started the first online conference, we were going into lockdown. Now we're all just starting to come out of it. And I mm -hmm. watched today's Ohio press briefing and like things are opening. Retail and um, uh, restaurants mm -hmm. are opening on the 21st. On the 15th, they're opening gyms and salons. I mean, these are big changes and we've been, conditioned for six weeks to be really afraid to do those things. So I, I can imagine that there's, will also, there will be another level of drain that's coming that we should be ready for. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we wanna get to your questions. Susan and I have a few that some of you sent us ahead of time. So we, we divided them up and we're gonna take them as we go. So the first question came to us from a woman named Andrea. And she has said that under normal circumstances, their weeks have had a nice rhythm of library visits, nature, co-ops, and all the changes of pace to their daily routine. But now with the social distancing, all that's missing, and she's worried that her kids are going to find the home environment stale. Anyone feeling that right now? So even though she's doing regular poetry tea times and Friday night movies, is there any other wonder in magic? that can be brought in to her life. So in my family, I know that one of the things, oh, right away, someone put reading aloud in the hammock. That's just beautiful. One of the things that I know right away helps my kids feel like something is special is changing the habits, allowing for a break in the routine. So maybe one morning your kids wake up and you say, today is the day we're going to binge watch Lord of the Rings and bake bread. Or maybe today is the day where we are going to, you know, um, play games, board games, and every person gets to choose one, and we're going to do a marathon of board games. In other words, because you have time, which you usually don't, now is the time to do those very time-intensive marathon or project-oriented experiences. I remember with my daughter, who was in high school at the time, she was sort of, she had outgrown sort of the art table of her youth and we hadn't had one set up for years. And we got to this point where we were missing spending time together. So we took a table and we put it in an empty room in the house and we turned it into a place where we could create 
visual art out of sentences we clipped out of old books that we didn't like anymore, like books we were never going to read again. And we made all of these visual collages of poetry that included glitter and paint and photographs. And then we superimposed sentences and created poems. And we, we used, it was all recyclable. We used hardback books, the covers that we were no longer using of these books. And we used those as our, um, our mounts. So we took what we already owned. We didn't have to go to the store and we created a space for sort of this visual writing collage work. That's the kind of thing that you have the opportunity to do now. Think about ways to maximize long amounts of time, really learning to crochet, not just doing the one stitch over and over. Look for something that requires a lot of time around it because you don't normally get time like that. Okay, that's going to be my answer. I'm going to switch now over to Susan for the next one. Um, I actually just wanted to add to what Julie said. I really think it's important, particularly in these times, that we not um, place expectations on ourselves about creating magic. I, one of the definitions of magic is that it happens as you go about other things. You can't make it happen. And to put on yourself, particularly at a time when, as we've just said, even going to the grocery store is a challenge, to put on yourself this sort of burden that you need to bring magic into your um, into your your home is a pretty sure way to just kill the magic right off the bat. <laughs> so I would say that please feel free to jump back in here, Julie. Um, but it, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of like getting up in the morning and saying, "Darn it, I am going to only eat 800 calories today." This is like the number one way you know it's not going to happen, right? Um, Instead of thinking, how do I create magic today? I think what you have to do is look at each child and think, what's one thing I can do that's going to give you a safe space in which to have imagination, mm. if that makes sense. And, mm. and that'll be, that might be different for each kid. And if you have multiple children, then don't pressure yourself to do that for every kid every day. But I do think as, as mothers in particular, and apologies to any dads who are here, that looking at each child every morning and taking the time, you know, it's, it's like morning journaling, except you're doing it about your kids, taking the time to think, what is one small thing that will give this child a space today will then allow a space where magic will happen. And it might be cookies. It might be you turning around and saying to your weeping 10 year old, do you know what? And again, Julie, jump in here if I'm off base. We're not going to do writing today. I want you to go draw a picture of anything that you want, if you know that's what that child loves. Just making a space for that to happen um, it of is course, a way of- absolutely. 100%, um, I'm with you. Um, and in fact, that's why I was saying, if you can conceive of this time as already the magical time, how can you use the time that creates some of the things you never have time for? That's what they're looking for. And most of your kids, already are relieved. They may even tell you they're relieved, that they're outside of the pressure, you know? I, I see also over in the chat that there are a lot of people talking about expectations. Mm. So I think this is a really good time for us to talk about expectations. And good. Maybe I'm a good person to do this because I kind of have the reputation for being the scary academic person. <laughs> so... <laughs> This is looking back on what I did with my kids. Yes, I'm really glad we did spelling and grammar and writing and math and all those basic skills. Um, it would have been great if I had given them more space in terms of history, science, and literature to explore what they were interested in as opposed to what I was interested in. I was very dismissive of graphic novels. I was very dismissive of interactive video games. I was very dismissive of things that had not been part of my upbringing. Mm. Um, and all the kids are fine and we still all love each other, but I think there were avenues there that would have given them tremendous creativity. And now that you're kind of stuck, um, is a really good time to say to yourself, and if this is the mental trick that makes it possible, great. Well, I can't have this kid do exactly what I want. So I'm going to relax my standards that's another word for letting go of unreasonable expectations. <laughs> and if they want to 
Um, if they want to go read Avenger comics for the next half hour, that is absolutely fine. What I'm going to do is think of a creative way to encourage them to give back out of that. Go read Avenger comics for, I do Avengers have comics. You know what I mean, though. Re go read they Avenger comics, comics for the next half hour. They all have comics. Go read Avenger comics for the next half hour. The only thing I ask you is come back with a drawing of, of a superhero that you created yourself and be sure to tell me what that superhero does. You know, I, there, you, I gotta share a story because this is amazing. So I had two interviews last week um, with women who are not homeschoolers, who are working from home and suddenly supervising their children's education. And one of them is a psychologist and I was doing a podcast with her, interviewed because she had read my book. And she came to this awareness that her children are learning best without the Zoom distance learning. She came to this awareness just by living with her children and being home all day, which she normally isn't. And here's what she told me. It's funny that you brought up comic books. She said, my son is really into comics. And I kept thinking he needed to do all this reading that the school had assigned. And instead, we sat down with a comic book and started looking at the pictures. And I suddenly realized the artists were really good at communicating the storyline through the facial expressions. She said, for the next hour, I would cover up the words and he would examine the facial expressions and tell me what the story was and what, and she goes, the next thing you know, we're having a whole psychology level discussion. He's 10 years old, all by how the face is designed to give cues. And he's learning all these things I would want him to know, like in a high school class. And mm -hmm. I thought, yes, exactly. That's, I mean, very much what Brave Writer talks about, but that's just being in tune with your child. You know, sometimes we're looking for like a list of things to look for and you can't always plan them. It's just that connection piece. And like you said, Susan, so beautifully, creating the space for it to even occur. It can't occur yeah. if there's no space for it. Yeah. Yep, I love it. Yeah. All right, next question, Susan. Okay, well, let's let's hit some of these live ones here. Um, Great. I, and we've got a couple of writing ones, so let's, you know how I feel about that. So let's tackle that. So Paula Garcia from Vermont, she says she has a seven-year-old who's now at home. She's doing Jot It Down in some arrow books. Um, he doesn't like writing, although he does it weekly. And then she says, he really hates it. <laughs> Should I do both? So that he continues what he's been taught. I want to continue to homeschool in the fall for the first time, and I'm apprehensive. So I feel like the advice that I would give for that is going to apply to a number of you out there. If you are doing a writing thing with your child that the child hates, stop. <laughs> now, just, just stop. Now, that's a little different from they don't like it. There are things we ask kids to do that they don't like. They may not like penmanship. They may not like spelling, but they're like, okay, I'll do it. That's different. If you've got a kid that is hating what you're doing in writing, then that curricula needs and that approach needs to go away. Um, I'm kind of curious because um, the next question then is the difference between our writing approaches, Julie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is great. Let's to... To, to this parent let's do that my approach to this parent would be to say well so first of all seven-year-old boys who hate writing are like um you know <laughs> colored leaves in the fall it, <laughs> right. it's really hard not to find one <laughs> so so don't fret too much about that and yes this child needs to be doing some writing every week Absolutely, because that's what will move him towards maturity slowly. But if he hates what he's doing, he's not doing the right kind of writing. My approach would be to say, a seven-year-old boy has a really hard time taking thoughts that are in his head, putting those thoughts into words, and then putting those words down on paper, because it's a multi-step process that he's not good at. And anytime we do a multi-step process that we're not good at, it's just really hard work. So I would say, read with him and have him do copy work every single day so that he gets used to writing without the pressure of coming up with the thing to put down on paper. He's developing some hand maturity because that's really important at that age. And he's just getting used to the syntax of writing. My suspicion is that he's being asked to come up with original, mature, complex ideas way too early and he's just not ready yet. So yes, he needs to do some writing. No, he does not need to be doing what you're doing right now. Particularly if you're thinking of homeschooling in the fall, you can ditch that. Copy work and read every day would be my approach. You would have, I think, perhaps a slightly different approach. It's pretty similar, um, but I might even scale it back further. So for copy work, for a seven-year-old boy who's struggling with a pencil, 
I might start by handing him window markers and drawing on a window, um, maybe tracing his name on a big piece of butcher paper that's on a wall, like getting a bigger arm movement going instead of the fine motor skills so that he can start to experience some pleasure of using the arm and seeing marks on a page. Right now, he's picturing that there's a right kind of mark to put on the page and he's he's struggling, it's, it's hurting, it's difficult, it's hard. So start with a bigger arm motion, start with sidewalk chalk, now's a great time for that, that's so popular out in the world. Uh, drawing, tracing around shapes rather than letters, and, and then gradually build up to this copywork on the daily or using a handwriting book. I know for my kids, one of the things that really changed things was to stop telling them how much to do and asking them how much they felt capable of that day. So it, it took away the decision of mom said it, I don't want to, to, well, what can you do? Well, now they're not thinking I want to or I don't want to. They're thinking, I wonder what I can do. And a lot of times they'll even say something really small, like, well, I can write one word. Let them mm -hmm. say, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Go ahead and write that one word, trace it, write it, whatever, and celebrate that word and build up the mechanic skills that way. Simultaneous to that, then jot down their thoughts random ones, when they come out of the blue, when they're the most interesting, just grab a sheet of paper and start writing them down. And later in the day, read that back to your child. Oh, Sally was telling me, or Bobby was telling me the most amazing story. And I jotted it down. I want to read it back and let him start to see these are two separate things. The thought, which eventually he'll be able to transcribe, but can't yet. And the transcription skills, which he needs to build up slowly over time. And Julia, I could add to that too, and I think this is going to apply to a lot of the questions that we see here. And Paula, awesome. you're welcome. You now have permission to ditch it. And Paula, I don't know if you saw this, just said he likes Brave Writers, so she doesn't have a problem. Ditch it. Oh, you're good to go. Awesome. Um, I'm good. But I, a lot of the questions we get, and we had we had one of these also from one of the write-in questions, um, yes. was uh, the parent says uh, she's read Karen Glass's book, No One Tell, and has been oh, doing yeah. narration, and it's been going well. She says, now that my daughter is in grade one, it seems like her narration attempts are not getting longer or more detailed. It's like we've hit a plateau. How do we move past these initial attempts at narration? Um, so this is a that that's a first grader. This is a Paula's kid is a seven year old. Um, I, I, I and I don't want to sound like an old cranky person, but now that I'm a grandmother, yes. and, I, and all my kids are grown. You realize that when you are when you are a first time parent dealing with your oldest child, you always think the oldest child should be about six years ahead of where they actually are. And I will tell you from experience that by the time you get to child four, you're like, ah, they're gonna figure it out. Um, so a, a seven year old who is not writing, and I was thinking about this, Julie, because what you were suggesting that seven year old do is gonna sound to a lot of people like what they would do with a three or four year old. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah, but right. that's where a lot of seven-year-olds are in terms of writing single words. Yes. Okay? You have to remember that between ages four and eight is about 15 years of developmental space. I mean, just in terms of what kids can do and what they can't. So, you know, if, when I hear from a parent who says my, my first grader isn't doing complete enough narrations, they don't have enough detail, or even my seven-year-old doesn't like to write, I'm like, well, duh, I mean, they're... They're, they're, that's seven. because they're six and seven. So, you know, if we can provide you with one thing that you take away from this, if your oldest child is little and you don't think they're doing enough, you need to stop and breathe um, because you just need to take them where they are. And as long as this is the key, as long as they are moving slowly forward, moving from wherever they are, at some point there's going to be this huge whoop and they're going to get up to where you wanted them to be, but they're going to do it on their schedule. They're not going to do it on yours. Your responsibility is just to be patient, gentle, and consistent. Not angry. I love that. I love and that. not expecting. Well, and here's the thing. I, you know, somebody in here wrote, um, Kelly, who's a fabulous homeschool mom. She says, if you write down narrations of the days for yourself of what's going well, 
even if you do it weekly or monthly, mm -hmm. and we recommend that in the Alliance, you will actually start seeing the progress. Sometimes yeah. we get too telescoped and microscopic, right? So you might have a child who's not writing, but they're following the instructions for a Lego set and right. building something from scratch. And that's a lot of literacy, a lot of finger, finger control, a lot mm -hmm. of instruction sequencing. So don't forget that your kids are demonstrating capability just because they're not looking strong in one area doesn't mean they're not growing. It just means right now, one area is growing at a different rate. Yeah, and I think I think the educational aspect of Legos is much underrated. Oh gosh. I mean, there's the instructions, oh, there's sequencing, there's fine motor coordination. Then there's, there's following a visual kids. model. I mean, that's really hard. Two dimensional, then there's three dimensional. After, after the kid builds the thing, you say to them, what is it? And let them tell you all about it. <laughs> and even write yes. it down and then take a picture of the Lego creation and put it on top of the narration. Perfect, Perfect. there you right. got it. Yeah. Susan, I saw today, someone sent me a picture of a little Lego man and the child had taken a, a, a little Lego scarf and put it over the face and made a masked oh. Lego man. <laughs> this is children. This Kids is how flexible. smart they are. That's they're, they're narrating the world we live in right now. Like right that now. counts. Take that picture, write that down. That would be perfect narration. Um, okay, go ahead, Susan, right. pick another one. Oh, shall I pick another one? Sure. Um, okay, I'm going to go look back at the live comments if I can. Um, Great. So, I, I, <laughs> so um, Sarah Dale says, how do I, I just think we need to circle back around to this again because it's occurring from several people. How do I give myself permission to lessen our regular homeschool schedule? I feel hey. guilty. <laughs> yes. Sarah BR says, I cannot do school right now. How do I get back into some sort of routine? My daughter is 10. Mm. Um, so, you know, so we, we have, this is going to be an ongoing issue here. Um, I'd actually like you to respond to that first. I just think okay. it's something that we should, we should highlight again because it's where we are. All right. So years ago when I was raising my children and we moved across the country during the school year and we completely lost what would have been the equivalent of a semester, I ran across some research from an educator who said that um, junior high was a waste of time. <laughs> and the reason they said that is that it is a time of consolidation of skills from kindergarten through sixth grade because their brains aren't mature enough yet for high school level learning. And so the weird backhanded conclusion this researcher had was, you could literally teach everything a child needed to learn between kindergarten and sixth grade in seventh and eighth grade. You could actually wait until your child was 12 and start there. And by the time high school started, they would be ready. And then they went on to say, which never happens because children can't help but learn between kindergarten and sixth grade. So whatever is lacking or whatever hasn't been really drilled over those first six years, could actually be attacked and progress could be made very swiftly because of the maturity level. And you're in this weird holding space. Junior high is notorious for repetition, trying to really nail down and create automaticity and skills so that when their brain does that nice ramp up for critical thinking, they're ready for high school. So that deeply reassured me. So here I was losing a semester and I thought, oh, well, we're gonna be fine then. And just the pivot to relaxing, Mm -hmm. Suddenly we were doing all kinds of cool stuff and I didn't even realize it was happening until I woke up one morning and realized, oh, my son just built a website. Oh, we started binge watching this one TV show and we're making um, ironic jokes all day long, masterfully using language, which led us to reading Shakespeare um, because of the correlation. Like suddenly I saw, oh yeah, I can't even stop the learning. I had lost my schedule, but I was, we were learning. So I say to you in this weird time, narrate, plan, I, uh, plan from behind is what I call it, where you actually write what you did, not what you're going to do. And start just being a detective of the learning that's taking place to offset that anxiety that you're not following a plan. Just know the plan is internal and you have tons of time. I, I think you have tons of time. Okay, Susan, your turn. Yeah, so what I would add to this, and then this is going to actually sort of feed into a few other questions. So um, so I see Fania just said, now there's a strong possibility that schools won't resume until January 2021. And K I, I think in some places that's actually true. Um, 
and that seven weeks at home is enough brain drain and time to turn things around where to start chaos has become our norm. I feel ya. Um, and then Beth also says, what would you recommend we do with our kids over the summer academically to help them not only avoid the usual summer loss of learning, but the loss of the last few months? So if I could put those two questions together with what you I like just it. said, Julie, I, like I it. think it might be really useful for parents to think about learning in two spheres. So here are the two spheres. And Julie and I are both humanities people. So you'll notice mm -hmm. we haven't talked about math. Any. <laughs> um, in, in, in the, this is my left hand, although it's your right hand now. In, in the left hand sphere, I think we put, we put basic important skills. And under that, I would put um, mathematical skills, you know, um, actually understanding how numbers work, how to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, understanding number concepts. I would put basic writing skills, by which I mean the ability to put words down on paper, and that would encompass some spelling and some grammar. And then in that also, I would put reading, knowing how to read, the um, not just the skill of sounding out, you know, words and sentences, but also a regular habit of reading every single day. I would think of those three things as the three absolutely foundational skills that you need to do every single day. Now, the good news here is that you can do those in under two hours, mm -hmm. right? And under two hours, we can all do that, even those of us who are working. I mean, I'm still working. Julie, well, you don't have kids at home. My kids are home. Uh, even if you're working, you can do those two hours, okay? You can do math. You can do writing, incorporating some spelling and some grammar, and you can do reading with them. That's your number one task is figure out, and this will reduce the feeling of chaos in your day. If you think to yourself, okay, two hours, we're gonna find two hours every single day and we're gonna do these things. Then think of the rest of the day as much gushier, you know, as much more malleable. Um, this is the time when we wanna do our more content areas. We wanna do history, we wanna do science explorations, we wanna do literature, but, if you don't get history done every day or even every week or science done every day or every week, they are not going to fall behind. They're not going to be disadvantaged. They're not going to get back into school and suddenly be like, oh, I can't do the work. Those are things that they will, first of all, absorb if you are reading and talking and, and doing virtual, you know, tours or whatever it is you're doing. And secondly, those are things that they will catch up on. The basic Correct. skills you really do need to think about those. Um, if they can't do math, if they can't write, if they can't read, that is going to come back and bite you. But this other bigger thing that they do for the rest of the day, you can relax much more about. So if you're thinking about how am I going to keep my kid, how am I going to stay sane, and how am I going to make sure that my kid is not completely disadvantaged when they go back to school, whenever that is, Think this first, you know, this little tight ball of skills first and how you're going to tackle that. But be realistic. That's not a six hour school day. That's an under two hour school day. And that's a lot more doable. And then think about the other topics as over here in a much more flexible way. Julie, you want to add to no, that? No, this that's all. I, I, I love that. In fact, I was um, just working on a sort of a guide for parents who are brand new to homeschooling, like a six week on ramp. And I had the parents building up over the first week to two hours, literally starting with like 35, 40 minutes, and then an hour and then 90 minutes, because I know how challenging it is. Like Sheena is talking about how one kid's got ADHD and um, she's having violent tantrums. And then the other child is six years old. And then they're trying to do their working from home. So reduce the size of what you're doing. We have a principle in Brave Rider we call the one thing principle. Pick the one thing that's bothering you the most and do that one thing and do it successfully. Schedule it for a couple of days from now, prepare so that when it happens, the day it's going to happen, you have the supplies, you've set aside the time, you've you know, found the video for the other child who isn't gonna be sitting with you while you work on reading with the nine-year-old. And then when you're doing that one thing, phone is off, you don't take text messages, you don't get up to let the dog out, you give the devoted attention to that experience with those children or with that child. And when it is done, I want you to not only pat yourself on the back, but a few days later, 
I want you to reminisce about it with the family. Remember when we did reading yesterday, sweetheart, or two days ago? That really felt good. I really liked that book we read together. Can you remember what was the name of that one character? Because I'm forgetting, but I, I love the storyline. In other words, what we usually do is we're racing. We're racing to get through the schedule. We are urgent about what needs to be on the schedule. We plan more than we can do. And then while we're in the thing we're doing, we're thinking about all the stuff that's not getting done. And we end up breathless and discouraged. What you'll find is if you can go one thing at a time. So the first time you pick this one thing, it'll be one thing in a day. Once you've experienced that, then you can add the second thing and give it the one thing treatment because it's the new thing. So to follow Susan's method then, if we're gonna focus on the three R's, pick one for the first day, maybe it's math. So you don't do writing, you don't do reading, you just think about how can I make math rich tomorrow for about a half hour with my kids. And while you're doing that, you're learning how they're behaving, what their temperament's like, what's clicking, you make notes, oh, I see, he didn't really like the manipulatives, but she really did. And you just actually be in what you're doing. And then when you're done, you're done. You go do something else. And then you think, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna do the same thing with writing. And if you do that over a three or four day period, one thing at a time, then you can try to combine them. But what's happening right now is it's like you have eight balls and you've never learned to juggle. And you're trying to do all eight and they're just falling. Start with one ball, <laughs> see how that feels. All right, now I'm gonna try the other ball because it's a different shape. Okay, now I'm gonna try two balls and build up over time. And I think even for parents that, are, that have been homeschooling, just to return to where we started, to recognize that things have changed and you are dealing with more stress and are trying, you, you are expending more energy to do the same things than you used to. So stop expecting yourself to get the same amount of school done. I love that. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's true. And in fact, just to piggyback, I realize a lot of moms who are dealing with kids who are on distance learning, that's a different experience. Um, they don't know what they're doing yet either, the schools. This is all unknown territory for everyone. So if you are doing your best to get them there on time, to watch, to fill out the worksheets, just know that may not feel super magical. It may not even feel super efficient, uh, but the school districts know this. And by next January, even by the fall, things are gonna be even better in that category. They're gonna learn things. We're already finding out the teachers are making huge modifications. So that's its own learning curve and you're not behind, you can't be, because everybody's in the same boat. Well, and and I think, you know, from what what I hear, from, I have, a, I have many good friends in New York City who um, whose kids are you know being sent home with had were sent home with lessons and are doing zoom school and some of the strongest women that I know have actually just um, sent messages back to the teacher and said no we're, we're, we just we can't do this we cannot do this and we're not going to do this and we'll see what happens in the fall but for right now goodbye we're done I love that wow that's that's remarkable. I know. I'm not sure that I would have had the, the strength to do that. Hey, so Julie, I wonder, so Beth actually bounced back and said that the two-hour window for basic skills is useful. Should we do it all summer as well? And then that also... Um, yeah, that goes with other questions about think summer. About, particularly Phoebe, who I really feel for Phoebe because she's homeschooling four boys in Brooklyn. And if I had homeschooled four boys in a city where I couldn't send them out to run around the block until they weren't driving me crazy, I'd have lost my mind. She says, I'm anxiously looking forward to a hot long summer in the city. Sleepaway camp is canceled, concerts and movies are off, parks, beaches and pools are closed. We usually take the summer off of homeschooling, but I'm wondering whether we should change our plan this year. How should we think about time off versus in session? And I think this is gonna be a really important question for everybody. Good, you tackle you wanna, it first. Do you wanna no, talk you go first, first about on this that, one. about yeah. what's, yeah. you do it. Hey, you want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, but then I want to hear what you have to say too. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think we are designed as human beings to need on and off times. And we, when I was a kid, and then I did this with my kids as well, we actually did year round school, but we did year round school in a very deliberate way. 
with big breaks around the holidays and big breaks in the spring and fall. And we knew those breaks were coming. And when those breaks came, we did something completely different. So just for example, on school days, everybody had to get out by a certain time and do their chores. And on non-school days, they didn't have to do that. They could sleep in. On school days, they were expected to get done their assignments before noon. And on non-school days, I let them get up and play video games. I mean, the difference there, I, I'm finding myself um, that I, apart from going to the grocery store on Tuesdays, I don't actually leave the farm. Yeah. But I'm finding that it's really important to keep routines so that on uh, mm -hmm. every, every weekday, I still get up, go down to my office, write in my journal and get started on work. But on Saturday mornings, I stay in bed and read and my husband brings me coffee. And there's no particular reason why he should do that on Saturday because he could do it any other day. But it's really important to me that I have a different day. Mm. And I think that's going to be true with our kids too. So I don't know that it matters what exactly you do during the summer, but I think it's very important that the summer not be exactly like what came before. Hmm. I like that. I, I love the notion of routine. I, I think routines are really helpful for a feeling of structure and then breaking routines feels like getting a treat, you know, like a candy bar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I love that your husband does that for you. Um, does he have like a twin or someone who could move in? I, I could... <laughs> I could use that right about now. <laughs> I'll let you know um, when quarantine is over. Yeah, right. Actually, I have a man in my life. And the way we've handled quarantine, because he actually interacts with the public. So we've decided to not quarantine together. So we never see, it felt like we were never seeing each other. It was all virtual. It was getting very lonely. We both live alone. And so we started having socially distant dates. And that's our new routine. So on Saturdays, we get takeout food and eat it on my deck. And we take a six foot apart walk <laughs> in my neighborhood. It's a very weird thing. And then we elbow bump when we say goodbye, but just having something to look forward to helps me not get into what would be my um, obsessive work personality, which is I would never stop. I would just work all the time because that's something that's available to do. So yes, I think a break in the routine is really important. I think it's good for kids to know they get to turn their minds off. Also, like I watch really garbage TV, love is blind. I mean, I've watched all kinds of stuff that I'm embarrassed to admit to because I do a lot of thinking. I use my brain a lot in the work that I do. And sometimes you just want to turn it off. You know, you just want to watch a friend's rerun, something that's just predictable. So for kids, I love that idea. And if they are trapped indoors, then they need a way to have an adventure. Uh, and I think video games are the way boys get that adventure. Um, I shared on the Brave Rider Facebook page today a post by a mother that was like in defense of video games. And just to give the thumbnail sketch, she's been letting her boys play more than usual. And one of them has formed this community of friends, teenagers, in I think it's Fortnite. And this little boy, 10-year-old, sort of noticed them in the space. And they kind of invited him in and they started playing with him and found out his birthday turning 11 was the next day and he had no birthday plan. So they kept him up till midnight. They sang happy birthday to him. They won battles for him. They gave him their special, whatever they win in Fortnite, I don't even know the game, and gave him a huge birthday celebration. And this mother was like in tears. And I, she said, so, you know, hell yeah, video games. And I thought, yeah, that's what we sometimes forget is that in this non-social time, socialization is happening through the computer. And that may be something that we have to relax more for this stay at home time for boys, especially, I mean, girls too, but boys, especially. How do you transition more sensitive kids to learn about more difficult topics? Mm -hmm. My kids are getting older and still want to stick their fingers in their ears. Oh God, I do have thoughts on this one. Yeah, when things like slavery or the Holocaust come up, or a pandemic that's killing thousands of people. Do you want to take that one first? <laughs> no, Julie, I think you should take that one first. I, I will take it. Um, yeah, I am ahead. happy to because I blew it so badly with my own children. Uh, so here's what happened. Susan made a very astute point earlier that your oldest child, no matter what age they are, you expect them to be way more mature than they actually are. But then you make the reverse problem happen with your youngest. You treat your youngest 
not so carefully around the topics of the world because they've already heard older kids tell off-color jokes, cuss, they've been around more violent movies. It's just, it's a weird thing. You're very protective of your oldest and you treat them like they're really mature. And then your youngest, you baby, but they're unprotected. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the weird. Did, did you notice that with your kids? Did that happen to you, Susan, with four kids? Absolutely. I'm sorry. I, I stopped this because you were blinking. But yes, oh. I was nodding the whole time. That is absolutely what happened. I mean, my, my now 28-year-old is still appalled by the things that we let our youngest watch. She's like, you made me be 17 before I saw that. And she was nine. I was like, but you were all watching it. What was I going to do? Lock her in her room? That's exactly right. Yeah. So here's what happened in my family that was just horrible. So do not do what I did. <laughs> I went to grad school in my early 40s and my degree is in theology. And I was studying social justice movements uh, from the 20th century in one of my classes. And so I would come home and watch documentaries. My oldest kids were high school and junior high, and my youngest were elementary. And I would put these videos on of Malcolm X, uh, the Holocaust, literally just what you're talking about, uh, civil rights movement in the United States, the history of slavery. And I thought I was doing this great thing because they were historical and they were documentaries and I was studying them. So I had more depth than usual. Traumatized my youngest child. I did not know it was traumatizing her because she did not tell me. So she was having nightmares and processing the information all by herself. And it came out years later when she started wanting me to watch Korean horror movies with her. And I can't do horror. I'm terrified of horror movies. And I sat her down and told her I did not want her watching these bloodbath Korean movies. And she, I said, because they, they're so likely to give you nightmares. She was 15. She goes, Mom, I had nightmares 10, 9, 10, and 11 from documentaries. I happen to know these movies aren't real. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. And we had to have this big, you know, I apologize for traumatizing you. Um, and to this day, she will say she was too young to handle that content. So to circle back to the question, you do have to know your child. And introducing those topics can be gradual, and it needs to be appropriate to the scale of what they can handle. So there's one thing to read about it, but it is far more emotionally confronting to have to watch a movie. Um, I still remember the first time I saw a movie. Did you see QB7 when you were a kid about the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. That thing did me in. I yeah. mean, I, for weeks. And I had forgotten. I was in fourth grade when that came out. And I was like curled up in the fetal position after it. And my dad had to really coax me out of that trauma. So there is a moment where taking in too much information is overwhelming. Um, so now tell them how they should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime a child is in their ear or figuratively putting fingers in their ear, I think you need to pay attention to that. Kids often, when our, our kids, what, what they are physically doing is cl are clues to us about things that are um, really happening to them that they don't have the vocabulary to express. Oh, good. And, and if they don't have the vocabulary to express it, that just tells you how real it is. They're not mm. making this up. They're not avoiding something. They cannot process it. So I say this to parents a lot that if a kid is getting angry, falling off the chair a lot, a lot of times with boys, if they keep falling off the chair or dropping their pencil, we get really annoyed. And what we don't realize is what they're saying is, I can't do this, but they can't say I can't do this because if they could say I can't do this, they would know they can't do this. And they don't know this because it's like two, it's two, it's right up here. They're down here and that's up there. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Yes. So a kid that's either literally or figuratively doing this is saying, I am not ready and you need to listen to that. Um, I am not in favor of, of artificially protecting children, mm -hmm. but I got to tell you this, they're going to get it. It's going to come. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen when their neural synapses are more developed and they have more experience of the world and they feel more secure in who they are. I would never, never advocate coddling children in terms of telling Agreed. them untruths. Or telling them that things didn't happen that did. But if a child is not ready to hear a story about slavery, that's mm. okay. Stories mm. are really, or, or about the Holocaust. Yes. 
stories are stories could be them yeah they need okay. to know that slavery was real they need to know that the holocaust happened and yeah. they need to reject anybody who says that they didn't but yeah. they don't need to have stories yet mm. Oh, that's come. such a good distinction. Yeah. I hadn't thought about the story element because, of course, by the time Catron was nine or ten, she did know that the Holocaust had happened. She did understand that slavery had happened. Right. Um, we have the Underground Railroad Museum here in Cincinnati, and I took all the kids to, to that exhibit, and it was very painful. It was very difficult. But the exhibits could be read or not read. You could move through them. You could talk about them as you were going, which is a little different than just a video scrolling through and you're seeing actual scenes depicted and a narrator and the music that's designed to try and evoke emotion. Um, so taking some of that sort of um, emotional piece out of it, you don't want it to lack emotion. It's good for them to feel sad. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a challenge. I will say this. By the time they're in high school, these conversations are essential. Yes. And I think absolutely. it's really important not to treat them with kid gloves. And it's okay if they have an emotional reaction. Jacob literally is a human rights lawyer today because of those movies, because of the conversations we had while I was in grad school. So there is value to it. I don't want you to now be afraid to share them with your kids. But I love what you said about the physical reactions. That's really you helpful. Just and you just have to watch them. And kids are ready for different things at different points. I noticed that a couple of people here are mentioning seeing the movie Roots on TV. Oh, um, I do remember that. Yeah. I think it's also really important to distinguish between uh, books and and film, video, TV at this point. I, a lot of people have observed this, but I'll just point it out again. A child who reads a story about the Holocaust will only provide those mental images that they are able to handle. Mm. Whereas a child who is given a film about the Holocaust has no defenses against that. So mm. the younger a child is, the more careful you have to be about disturbing images. And I expect that's, you know, what your daughter was expressing to you. Absolutely. It yeah, it wasn't the fact of the atrocity. It was that the, there were video there and they, they had no way to filter it. Correct. That's, that's no, a, that's right. Yeah, that's a strong argument for me in terms of, you know, a certain amount of censorship when children are little. That. Mm. They can't filter images, but they can filter words to a much greater extent. Yeah, I love that. That's excellent, excellent point. Okay, Julie, we have so many more questions here and we've only got six minutes left. What are we gonna do? Oh, well, we can keep talking. Uh, I have to go feed my sheep in 15 minutes. <laughs> I can hear them, they're yelling <laughs> at me. Well, let's see here. here. Uh, oh, let's do a special needs question because that yeah, one is very that. often. Samantha asked, I asked this in the conference, but you didn't have time to answer. Now we do. Now we do. I have three special needs children. My oldest is high functioning autistic, who is also a savant in math, art, music, and science. He lacks in communication and writing. I've been having trouble with consistency with him on his trouble spots because my other two are ADHD. My middle child also is SPD and my youngest is ODD. Whoa. So consistency is hard for various reasons. Oh, Susan, you you want me to answer that? I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> I can come back. <laughs> um, first of all, just full disclosure, my professional background is not in special needs. So a lot of times I do refer people to specialists. Uh, Rootedinlanguage.com is one that I recommend all the time. She does an amazing job of working with kids of all different uh, limits, such as these. But I think one of the things that has helped us the most in Brave Rider with our students who come to us with issues is that we put valuing the child and the connection to the child at the center of the learning experience. So it's not, sometimes when we get these labels on kids, it's like we think there's something more to do. And there may be some very helpful strategies. I'm not saying that there aren't. But what I, I know to be true is we all have to be detectives of who our children are and learn them and then accommodate those, those pieces of who they are that we now understand better. And it just means a whole higher level of giving that kind of devoted attention. So if communication and writing are struggles, I would be looking at where he's a savant and skillful and wondering what correlation you can make. Can he communicate? If he's struggling with communication, can we take advantage of what he's good at and work on communication using what he's good at? 
Uh, can we work on writing based on the things he knows intimately, as opposed to thinking of this as a separate category, and now he's got to learn how to communicate about the humanities, because that's two skills being worked on at the same time. That'd be my first step. Susan? Um, Challenging question. It's it, well, it's a difficult question. So, but I'm th I, so I'm I'm thinking of this more in terms of Samantha's sanity, mm. um, because I also am not. I, I I have one kid who who had some you know pretty serious um, special uh, learning needs that I didn't recognize at the time. Um, yeah. It was it was a long time ago. What can I tell you? I'm sorry. I have regrets. Um, but when you're dealing with when you're dealing with kids who are non-neurotypical, I think one of the first things to recognize in this present moment is that they are processing input differently than you are. And they are getting input and probably a lot of the input they're getting from you is that you're uncertain and scared and anxious and everything has changed. That's great and feedback. Probably have super, super sensitivity to that and also limited ways to understand what's actually happening. So this would be a good time to stop and take a breath and think, all right, over the next, and, and take a super short view and say, what do I wanna do over the next two months? For each child, what is my number one priority for each of these children over the next two months? And I'm a fan of this, write it on your calendar, Put it in your, I, I use a, an online a calendar or put it in your planner or whatever. Make yourself a physical note that says, I'm going to stop and reevaluate on, let's see, this is May, June, July. On July the 7th, I'm going to stop and reevaluate and decide, do I still want to focus on this or I want to focus on something else? But okay. for the next two months, if you can focus on one thing consistently for each kid, then that'll give you the space to do that. It'll give them the space to be uncertain and weirded out and not sure what's going on because they are, whether or not they're expressing it. And then I guess the other thing I would say is, and it's only two months, right? So you're not like setting the entire year, just one thing for two months. And then if there is anyone who is, you know, sheltering in place with you, your spouse, your partner, your mother, your, you know, who, your grandmother, if there is anybody else who can then pick up one other thing per child that you can say to them, look, over the next two months, I want you to work on whether it's spelling or math or science or art. I want you to do an art lesson with, with the kid, you know, twice a week. Hand that over to somebody else and then don't tell them that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> Just hand it over to them with the understanding that you weren't getting it done anyway. So even if would or do well at least that thing that's happening that wouldn't have if you hadn't handed it over so i'd say a combination of narrowing your focus for the next two months and then trying to hand off to someone else mm -hmm. some part of what you're doing might start to release the log jam just a little bit yeah i think that's true and i think also um seeking outside help can be really supportive somebody who's got some training or somebody who you know, we do in our online writing classes, I know Susan has online classes as well, but we actually have classes that teach parents. And if you're interested in having like more strategies to try, we've seen a lot of really good results um, for parents who have uh, non-neurotypical kids with writing and communication. That's something that we're actually good at. Uh, I did an interview, uh, I was on an interview on ESPN of all things um, for this school Julie, program. Sports made than you. I know, it made me so happy. I was like, life made. I was on ESPN. But we were talking about school, and the other guest that was featured with me runs a company called New Frontiers, and they do executive function coaching. So if you have kids who are struggling with their executive functioning skills, you can hire them virtually to help the child start to create those um, pathways and those practices and they know what those are and they know how to coach kids who have those struggles. So, uh, you know, when Noah was ADHD undiagnosed and I was raising him, I sought a therapist, I sought an educational specialist. Repeatedly, we were told that he didn't have ADHD, but every one of them said, but those strategies would probably work for him. 
And then they gave me things I could actually try with him that did work. And then in college, they're like, no, yeah, he really does have it. <laughs> so I think triangling in expertise, sometimes we, we forget to do that as homeschoolers because we're used to thinking we should do everything. But I just think that helps. It makes you not feel so alone in the struggle and you get ideas you wouldn't think of on your own. Yeah. So Julie, yeah. um, I have to go. Yes, we're at the end. We're at the end. I know. And I feel bad because there's so many more questions, but I, we could talk forever and, and not necessarily get these. Um, so uh, we're going to do this again, right? Oh, we certainly can. Um, so here's, here's how this will go. We're going to end. The replay will be both on Facebook on the Brave Writer page and also on the homebound page of Brave Writer. Susan, if you want to host it somewhere, we can give you a copy too. Uh, and then that way you can watch it for as long as you want. When we finished last time, Susan emailed me, well, that was fun. Let's do this every month. And I was like, ah! <laughs> but I, I would love to. She's my favorite person to do this with. So we will make sure this happens again. We'll check in with you again in a couple of months and we will keep it going. We absolutely love meeting with you. Susan, say your Fair goodbyes. <laughs> Well, I love you. You're great to work with. And I think we bring a good one-two punch. What do you guys think? <laughs> Everybody stay safe. Yes. Um, wash Wear your masks. Mask. Susan, Wear your masks. Yeah, Susan, do your uh, virology thing right at the end here. You're writing a book on all I'm of these. Writing, oh, yeah. I'm writing a book about um, epidemics, which is just the greatest thing to be doing right now. Anyway, um, there's a, there is a huge body of evidence showing that the polio spread um, in the 19, between 1910 and 1920, that much of it was impelled by asymptomatic carriers. They didn't know they were sick. They never had a fever, but they spread it anyway, and masks help. So you don't wear a mask for you. You wear a mask for other people. It's an expression of compassion towards your community. It's an expression of faith that we can do something uh, to make this better. So wear a mask wash your hands, um, eat a lot of good food, mm. and spend some fun evenings watching movies with and reading with and doing music with your kids. That is perfect. That's how we're going to end. Goodbye, everybody. We love Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming.